Thank you so much for including me in this event. It's such a pleasure to be here. This afternoon, I would like to introduce Sisters Olanka and Mariska Karas, two Hungarian-born American modernist designers who had successful careers in New York City. I first encountered their names on a list of under-researched American modern female textile designers in a graduate textile history class at the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. Each student in the class selected an artist from the list to study, and I ended up with Alanka. And this was in 1997, and she and Mariska have been a part of my life ever since. At the time, Alanka was known almost exclusively as a designer of early American modern decorative arts from the late 1920s. The rest of her career was largely forgotten, as was that of her sister, Mariska. Though Mariska's later work, her embroidered wall hangings, survived in a lot of museum collections. Washington, D.C. turned out to be a great place to start my research on the sisters. First, the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian had great resources, especially in the years before the digitization of newspapers. But more importantly, Mariska's older sister, Solveig Cox, and she's in the upper right, was in Alexandria, Virginia, just south of Washington. And Solveig, an artist herself, had all of her mother's papers and textiles, and she shared many stories about the sisters with me, and she eventually put me in touch with other members of her family, including Ilanka's granddaughter, who is also named Ilanka, and she's in the lower center photo. And this Ilanka had all of her grandmother's archives. Though using the term archives implies more formality and organization than was present when I first worked with those materials. Okay. The family welcomed me warmly. I had the honor of presenting exhibitions on Alanka in 2003 and Mariska in 2007 with accompanying publications at the Georgia Museum of Art at the University of Georgia, where I worked before becoming an independent scholar. And I've published several articles on them over the years and regularly field questions about them. Both have been featured in the magazine Antiques, Alanka even got the cover, and she also had a small exhibition at the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum in New York in 2017. Often, when I talk about Alanka and Mariska, I focus on them as American designers, so I'm excited to have the opportunity today to highlight what is Hungarian about their work. And today, I will emphasize the early parts of their careers when the European influence was most pronounced. The sisters were born in Budapest, Alanka in 1896, and Mariska in 1898. Alanka attended the Hungarian Royal National School of Arts and Crafts in Budapest, where she was one of the first women admitted, and in 1912, her work was included in an exhibition there. She immigrated to the United States in 1913. While in Budapest, she was influenced by Austria's Wiener Werkstatt and its emphasis on stylized natural motifs, simplified ornamentation, and two-dimensional patterns, both abstract and geometric, as well as its inspiration from traditional folk arts. And you can see a strong influence from Hungarian peasant art, which is filled with bright colors and simplified floral designs in Alanka's early work. On the left is a textile design she created for a silk chiffon circa 1917, and on the right is a book illustration design from 1915. Ilanka quickly settled in the Greenwich Village scene in New York City, the center of bohemian arts and culture. One of the earliest records of her is as a student of the German-born modern artist and designer Wienald Rice at his arts and crafts studio in 1914. Rice painted the portrait of her on the left, and I was pleased to be able to identify her as the subject of the painting through my research. The photograph on the right is attributed to the Hungarian-born American photographer Nicholas Murai, and he took a lot of photos of the sisters, and his images provide some rich documentation of this early period and reflect that they sought out other artists from their home country. And Mariska's daughter Solveig said that when Hungarians showed up in New York, her mother was immediately friends with them. At least two photographs of Alanka by Murai even appeared in the magazine Vanity Fair. American artist Eugene Speaker also painted her portrait, shown on the left, and this portrait was described in the newspaper, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle in 1915, as portraying Ilanka Karas, quote, whose devil may care attitude, her arms akimbo, and whose slumbering passion and her coal black eyes inspire one with dread of what kind of weapon she would use when angry, end quote. 
So you start to get this image of Alanka early on as an unusual character. She's presented as a little exotic, as passionate, as intimidating. And if she didn't exactly actively promote that image, it doesn't seem that she did anything to dispel it. And her niece and granddaughter certainly found her formidable later in life. This portrait was illustrated in a publication called the MAC, short for the Modern Art Collector. And this large scale, full color publication was produced by the Society of Modern Art, which was founded in late 1914 by a group of European born American modern artists, including Ilanka and Wienald Rice. Ilanka contributed the Wiener Werkstatt inspired textile designs in the center and the designs for the department store Bonwa and Teller on the right along with theatrical posters, wallpaper designs, advertising designs, and typography. The MAC was published from 1915 to 1918. And in the first issue, the group stated its mission, writing, quote, our object in bringing out these pages at this time in America is to enable this country to keep in touch with modern artistic European tendencies at a date when traveling to Europe is freighted with difficulties and thereby encourage the development of the modern movement in this country." End quote. So clearly, Alanka was part of a mission to bring modern design from Europe to the United States. In these early years, Alanka was involved to varying degrees with a number of little magazines in New York. And in particular, she had a lot of drawings in Bruno's Weekly, a small black and white periodical published by Guido Bruno, an eccentric Greenwich Village figure from July 1915 to December of 1916. And his garret was located on Washington Square and was a center of Greenwich Village activity. Guido Bruno wrote a brief article on Alanka that appeared in his weekly in December 1915, suggesting a reclusive artist hiding in a magical retreat. <clears throat> he described her home as a tiny building, maybe a former woodshed, behind an old residence on Washington Place that she painted herself. She painted the walls and the window sills and the furniture and the floors. There are no images of that residence, but this chest perhaps gives a hint of what it looked like. It's in the style of traditional Hungarian painted folk furniture, and inside she added the words in Hungarian, made by Elona Karaz with God's help in the year 1916 in the summertime, and a couple of lines about geraniums and love. The colorful setting Guido Bruno encountered also included works like these. And Alanka, though not well known as a painter today, successfully exhibited paintings during the late teens and 20s. And generally, her paintings are small or medium in size and full of extraordinary and unexpectedly vibrant colors. Bruno also saw commercial fashion designs around the residence, and Alanka explained to him that she wanted to paint images of saints and things, but she needed to paint the fashion plates first. She told him, I'd like to live somewhere out in the forest, and I would like to live all by myself. He wrote that she, quote, wanted to be free of the old world prejudice of her Hungarian home that women cannot compete with men in art. She was the only woman art student in her town, and she found a good many limitations, end quote. And he believed that Greenwich Village was just the place with surroundings congenial to her. Morris de Camp Crawford, the design editor for the fashion industry trade journal Women's Wear and research associate in textiles for the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, also provided important descriptions of Alanka. In particular, he once noted, quote, she seriously took me to task because I had never published in women's wear any motif taken from the Hungarian peasant art, which she knows and loves so well." End quote. And at the time, Crawford was spearheading an effort to encourage American industries to employ American designers who look to historical American arts for inspiration. So basically, he wanted to connect museums and designers and industry. And Crawford encouraged designers to visit the museum and to look at historical designs of the Americas, both North and South, and he also advocated for European folk arts as a fertile source of inspiration. So Alanka was an ideal artist to him, and he was a great champion of hers. He admired her passion for modern design and her passion for the simplicity, directness, and sincerity of folk art. He wrote in 1916, quote, her life was spent among the beautiful peasant art of the Hungarian people, and she has taken her inspiration in no unstinted measure from this source. 
And like many other artists in America, she has felt the need for such an inspiration here." And, end quote. and according to Crawford, she was finding that design inspiration in the collections of the American Museum of Natural History. And these are some garments Ilanka designed while studying the museum's collections. Again, she's not known as a fashion designer, but as the digitization of newspapers becomes better and more accessible, I keep learning new things about the sisters, which is exciting. In the left image from 1917, the left dress was inspired by motifs from Fiji, and the one on the right was influenced loosely by Russian designs. In the image on the right from 1918, dresses one, two, and five were inspired by items from the Philippine collection, three from the Burmese collection, and four is a modification of a Russian blouse of white linen with red embroidery on the sleeve, which you'll recognize from the Vinald Rice portrait of her. Alanka was looking to many sources beyond Hungarian designs. She was just using what was available to her in New York City. But her appreciation of Hungarian folk art helped her in this pursuit of design inspirations. And you can already see from the first few slides that Alanka approached all arts equally and that she had her hand in everything. She made batiks, she taught, she created ceramic designs, she made illustrations and lithographs, and the lithograph on the right titled Group of Figures was selected by the American Institute of Graphic Arts as one of the 50 prints of the year in 1926. In the mid-20s, Alanka also began contributing illustrations and jackets to a variety of books, as well as cover designs to the New Yorker magazine. She went on to success in the late 20s and 30s with furniture, silver, ceramic, textile, and nursery design, and at the time was recognized as one of the leading American modern designers. In 1928, she moved out of Greenwich Village to Midtown Manhattan. She participated in the American Designers Gallery and the American Union of Decorative Artists and Craftsmen, uh, both of which were largely populated by European-born designers, and both of which advocated for modern American design, which was strongly influenced by modern European design. Ilanka was embraced as an American designer, and her designs were celebrated as American designs. But clearly, she was expressing influences from Europe, from Hungary early on, and by the late 20s, from Germany and the Netherlands. Elanka became a leading wallpaper designer in the 1940s, especially after World War II. And here you see street games in the middle from 1941 and ducks and grasses from 1948, both of which were manufactured by Kotzenbach and Warren. And she continued to design jackets for books as well as covers for The New Yorker throughout her career. And between the year of the magazine's founding in 1925 and the mid-1970s, she contributed 186 cover designs to The New Yorker. And one of my favorite days of research was going through the big book of New Yorker covers with Alanka's niece Solveig and listening to all the stories about each of Alanka's designs. And this cover from 1945 depicts the beasts in her garden. So I'm gonna fill in a few personal details. In 1920, Alanka married Willem Nyland, a Dutch chemist, and they built a home in Brewster, New York, about 100 kilometers north of the city out in the country. It was featured in the popular home magazine, House Beautiful, as her summer studio in July 1928. Over the decades, they added room after room in a meandering fashion up the hill, as you see on the left, creating a colorful, quirky, and really special place with lots of hidden nooks and crannies and idiosyncrasies. In the mid-1920s, Alanka and Willem became involved with George Ivanovich Gurdjieff, the Russian mystical spiritual leader who advocated achieving a higher consciousness through methods he developed, and his teachings remained a major factor in their lives. Alanka and Willem had two children, Carola in 1932 and Eric in 1936, and Alanka died in 1981. As we transition between sisters, I want to share a few excerpts of something that Marishka wrote about Alanka in 1921. I'm not sure of the circumstances, but it seems like a toast of sorts, and it reflects a tenderness between the two. And Marishka wrote, quote, My little sister, as I often call her, may be namely justified by her height, which is two inches less than mine. And as to weight, I often pick her up for the sheer joy of having her beg me to put her down. And though she sometimes flies up in the air, Alanka prefers the solid ground to walk on. 
Her belief of a solid foundation is expressed in her deep black eyes. Her hair would complete, compete with the blackness, but it is straight away inclined towards blue. She wears her hair Mona Lisa style, but puts it in a knot instead of leaving it hang, even though she does not approve of nuts or nutty things. Her seriousness is a part of her Hungarian temperament, and often people like to call her a gypsy. Alanka's daily vivacity varies from 50 to 60 miles an hour, which includes cleaning, cooking, dishwashing, sewing, painting, tidying, reading, letter writing, being a wife, and a social center if necessary. The depth of Alanka's thinking is unfathomable, even by Vim, and its relativity only Einstein could relate. Sometimes she is completely lost in this world, but Vim being in it saves her." End quote. So the sisters were close, and their careers intersected, but they worked independently. In general, Mariska's story is easier to tell because she was much more outgoing than Alanka, and because she liked to write, and because her production was more focused and linear. Mariska immigrated to the United States in 1912, the year before Alanka. Their mother was already in the US, and their father died before they left Hungary. Their younger brother, Steve, also came to the US. And the family details are a little hazy from these early years, but it's clear that Mariska had an interest in sewing from a young age. She began studying design at Washington Irving High School, then at Cooper Union Art School under Ethel Traphagen, who later founded an important fashion school. By age 16, Mariska was making all of her own clothes and Alanka's as well. By age 18, so this would be about 1916, she was working for two prominent department stores in New York City, Wanamaker's and Bonwit Teller, and she was gaining practical experience and exposure for her designs. With Bonwit Teller, she designed beachwear, and the store presented a window display of beach clothes Mariska designed based on Native American patterns she had studied in the museum with Morris de Camp Crawford. So she was doing the same thing that Alanka was doing. These are renderings for some blouses she designed at Wanamaker's that were illustrated in women's wear with articles by Crawford in 1917. And in one article, he described her as thoroughly American, despite her interesting name, and wrote that anyone familiar with Magyar peasant art will see the basis for this child's inspiration. And as with Alanka, he regarded Mariska as an ideal example of an American artist creating American styles even though her work was strongly expressive of her Hungarian background. And here are a couple of images of Alanka wearing a dress by Mariska, so you can get an idea of some of the colors she was using and what the crocheted bands looked like. Throughout her career, Mariska was noted for her skillful and unusual use of color. And she wrote in 1931, quote, I remember in art school, we had depicted the color chart and were to make complementary and analogous color harmonies. How I cheated, ignored all I was told, worked out the given color problems by instinct, and got put at the head of the class." End quote. She added that many color-starved women came to her for clothes. After working with the department stores for a couple of years, Mariska decided that she really wanted to be a freelance designer. So by 1921, she showed blouses and dresses at a small shop in Greenwich Village that was owned by a Hungarian friend. Her work sold well, and after about a year, she opened her own studio. And she eventually settled at 228 Madison Avenue on the edge of the garment district, so she was ideally located for a clothing boutique. By the mid-1920s, she was starting to get more mainstream attention. She was even featured in the Boston-based newspaper, The Christian Science Monitor, in 1926. And her work was notable because of her unique combination of traditional Hungarian elements and a modern American style. And this fine applique was popular in traditional Hungarian textiles, and Mariska presented it with both folk-inspired designs and with notably modern designs, including New York's iconic skyscrapers. She worked closely with customers, and she was interested in matching the colors of the clothing to the colors of the individual woman's hair and eyes and skin. And some women bought whole wardrobes from her, and they paid moderate prices for unusual handmade garments. And to give you an idea of some of the colors and designs, here's one description from the Christian Science Monitor of a two-piece outfit, quote, fashioned of white flannel and edged with magenta braid. On the skirt was an applique of three bands, one of dull purple, another cerise, and the third green. 
On the blouse, the same colors were used to form a quaint design of little houses and trees. Mariska traveled abroad most summers, studying current fashions and getting materials. She imported embroidery and applique from Hungary and had women in the United States sew for her. So she offered some actual Hungarian elements in her designs, but everything was cut and styled for her audience in the United States. And this image in the upper left is from a scrapbook of one of her visits to Hungary. And you can see the women wearing traditional costumes with a lot of floral embroidery. And that same type of embroidery appears in her clothing, as you can see in the back of the jacket on the right. The invitation reads, I promise to let you know of my return from abroad. When you are shopping in my neighborhood, come up to see the models I brought back with me. So she was touting her connections to Europe and promoting the work she made in New York City. One traditional Hungarian costume that particularly caught her attention was the shepherd's coat, the sir. Here are photographs from her scrapbook of men wearing the traditional coats and of her trying one on from the mid-1920s. And you'll notice that these are worn over the shoulders with the arms not going through the sleeves. And this is how she transformed it into a stylish evening wrap for American women. A newspaper clipping from 1927 records that she brought a shepherd's coat back from her last trip to Europe that was of ivory white felt cloth with colored appliques in red and green. And the clipping reads, quote, these coats have been worn by the peasant men in Hungary, but there are few of them left. It was with some difficulty that she found an old man who could make one for her. And she said it was almost impossible to persuade him to alter the design of the collar a little to what she thought would be a better line for her purpose." End quote. So this is a very direct way that she brought Hungary to America through fashion. In 1928, Mariska showed her work in California, where these photographs were taken. And these are great examples of her applique designs. And then on the vest on the right, you can see how she incorporated the embroidery. And if you happen to visit the Costume Institute at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York anytime soon, you can see an example of one of her applique dresses in person in the exhibition Women Dressing Women. While in California, Mariska met a young naval lieutenant named Donald Peterson, who later worked in advertising and radio. And they had a whirlwind romance and marriage. And as a wedding gift, Ilanka and Willem gave them land adjoining theirs in Brewster. So the sisters created, according to their families, this little bit of Hungary together in the country. Mariska's house was much more modern than Ilanka's, though. It was made of poured concrete, painted white, with red trim. In August 1928, the magazine House Beautiful featured both sisters' New York studios, which is an indication of their high profile at the time. And here you see Mariska and hers with a mix of textiles from around the world, framed images of traditional Hungarian costumes, modern furniture designed by her sister, and a dress of her own design. And on the right is another Marai portrait where you can appreciate her very modern bobbed hair. Mariska and Alanka had two daughters, Solveig and Rosamund, in 1931 and 1932. And after they were born, Mariska began designing children's clothing. And she did this because she couldn't find appropriately modern clothing for her modern little girls. Her new designs still incorporated the applique and embroidery that defined her fashion, but she added fun images for kids and elements that were easy for young hands to manipulate. On the left, the girls are modeling dresses with their dolls. And Mariska designed fashion until the early 1940s and wrote several how-to books on sewing and embroidery. The World War II era was difficult for Mariska, as anything Hungarian lost its glamour for Americans. And when she could no longer travel to Hungary, she found embroidery briefly in Guatemala and Mexico. Around this time, she also got divorced and she had a studio fire in which she lost existing work and documentation of a lot of early work. And you may have noticed some water damage on the photos from California, which uh, may have been from the fire event. However, Mariska emerged post-war with a successful new career as an artist working with textiles, creating distinctive embroidered wall hangings. And her earliest works were representational with thread covering most of the surface, but she soon took inspiration from the abstract expressionists with whom she was friends and began to work with abstraction and a much more open touch. She had exhibitions all across the United States in the late 40s and throughout the 1950s, 
which is how so many of her embroideries ended up in museum collections, and her work was even included in the Brussels World's Fair in 1958. But all of the works have their roots in the traditional needlework of her homeland and display the distinctive, her distinctive use of color and texture. And here you can get a sense of the scale of her embroideries, and you can see her daughters standing beside their portraits, which was a special moment. And Mariska died in 1960. So this is just a very quick overview of the early years of their careers as Alanka and Mariska each found a way to express their Hungarian origins in their modern American lives. And please keep them in mind as you work on your future projects and papers. I'm always happy to share information and do what I can to help make sure that their stories are remembered. Thank you.